Praise the Lord. All right. So everybody say it out loud. I'm ready to hear. All right. Matthew chapter 9 is where we're going to start. We started last week. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. When Jesus departed there, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Now, son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I'm able to do this. And they said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. The contemporary English Bible says it will happen for you just as you have believed. You know, just because something, just because God's able to do something doesn't mean it's going to happen for you. The question is not what God's able to do. You remember the, the, uh, the father whose son was epileptic or whatever that he had and would fall in fits and it was, he was actually demonized and, and the, the disciples couldn't cast him out. They, they, then Jesus comes down and the father's all upset and Jesus tried to find out what's going on. How long has this been happening to him? So on and so forth. And the guy cried out and said, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can help me do something. And Jesus said, if you can, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. The, the question is not what God can do. God can turn your situation around in a moment of time. But he has to have something to work with. He needs your confidence and your trust and your faith in him that he's a faithful God and he'll do what he said. So, I like the message translation that says, he touched their eyes and said, become what you believe and it happened and they saw. Everybody say it out loud. Become what you believe. Now, if you've been attending church here very long, you know one of our favorite scriptures is what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, where he said, the thief comes in order to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a thief out there. If you don't understand why the world's jacked up is there's a thief out there. That's why the world's mess. Why are kids starving to death all over the world? Because there's a thief out there. You have an adversary, the devil. He roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The problem is not God, it's the devil. And he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If it's stealing, killing, and destroying, it comes from the enemy who is your adversary. But Jesus said this, I came that they may have and enjoy life, have it in abundance, to the full, till what? So Jesus came so you could have a good life. And that shouldn't just be doctrine or theology. Well, Jesus came to make things better. Jesus came so you could have an enjoyable, fulfilling life, finish the reason that he created you and put you on this planet, and finish your course with joy, and then depart and go to be with the Lord, which is far better. Are you here? So we are... We want to experience that in our life, an abundant life. He didn't come down here, suffer and die, die an atoning death and a cursed death. Yeah, I know he was the Lamb of God and, and he died and shed his blood like the animal to, to do away with animal sacrifices, but they didn't treat animals like they did Jesus. When they crucified the lambs, they didn't beat them to death. They didn't torture them to death. They just cut their throat and killed them. They treated Jesus worse than an animal and beat him and tortured him to death. And he died, descended into hell, resurrected on the third day, went into heaven with his own blood, put it on the mercy seat, and he did it to redeem us and bring us into his kingdom, not to come down here and say, well, I hope that helped you a little bit. It was so we could live in a powerful, overcoming enjoyable life, finish his course, stomp the devil's head every time he sticks it up in our face, stomp his head and let him know Jesus is Lord and you are defeated. <laughs> but we need to have that in our experience. It needs to be a reality in our life. So that's what we've been talking about. And so for some of you who weren't here, we, we said three things last week, make a decision to change. Nothing happens if you don't make a decision. If you're just going to, if you don't ever think about where you're going, just make, you know, we're just going to go through life. Whatever will be, will be. I'm satisfied with what I have. I just want to work every day and come home and eat supper and watch television, get up, do it again. I'm happy with that. That's all that I want in life. Well, nothing's going to happen. Nothing changes if nothing changes. But I don't want you just to, to, live your life 
just, you know, barely getting by and you're not happy and you're not fulfilled and you're not accomplishing anything and that's not what God has for you. He wants you to get up every day with, with pep in your step. He wants you to get up every day and enjoy where you're at and be a blessing to the people that are around you, have a song in your heart. Can I get an amen? Amen. But, but you're going to have to make a decision to change. Second thing we said last week is, you know, you got to get a godly vision for your future. Where there is no vision, people perish. That's, that's the issue that we have right now in our culture all over the world with young people. They're perishing. How come they have no vision for life? Somebody told them, well, I mean, you're just here by accident. I mean, evolution's how everything got here. There's no creator you're going to answer to. There's no God. He didn't make you for a purpose. You might as well eat, drink, be merry, stay high, take, dro- take drugs, do whatever you want to do because, I mean, life is short. You might as well just have fun while you're here. No purpose, no vision for the future, nothing they want to accomplish. Why? Hey, if there's no God, nothing matters, baby. But there is a God, there is a creator. We're all going to stand before him and he loves you. He wants you to finish your good life down here and then go and to be in his eternal kingdom where we're going to rule and reign forever. Can I get an amen? amen. So you, you, you got to just get a vision for your future. What's it going to be like? Where do you want to go? Third thing we said is get ready and start preparing. David prepared while he was out keeping his father's sheep. He killed the lion and the bear out there before he ever got to Goliath. Get prepared. Okay, you want to be the supervisor? What are you doing about it? Do you know their job? Can you do it forward and backwards? You want to run your business? Do you know anything about it? Do you know how much it takes, how much it costs? Get prepared. Get prepared. You got to get prepared for your future. All right. So then today we're going to just hook on to this, and, and I'm going to say this, number one. So here's today. Are you ready? You got your seatbelt on. Are you ready? Here we go. Stir up your hopes. Everybody say it out loud. Stir up your hopes. hopes. Got to have some hope. Hebrews 11 one says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What if you don't hope for anything? Well, then your, your faith has no substance to bring hopes into reality. Your hope is your goal. It's your dream. It's what you believe God put in your heart for you to accomplish. Hope is... Biblically speaking, anticipation or expectation of good. Expectation of good. You, you've got to have expectation of good. Webster's Dictionary says it this way, confident expectation of good. Now, a lot of people have misplaced hope. They have hope that, you know, in mankind, you know, maybe the Avengers are going to show up. Maybe medical science is going to get so advanced that there's no more sickness and they can can cure everything and and, uh, we're just going to live forever because they know how now to fix our genes and we're just going to live forever and they're hoping in medical science. Or, hey, our education is our hope and we're just going to get so smart they're going to invent a pill that you can take and your brain is going to function 100% of the time and it's just going to be amazing. Well, you just have a bunch of smart sinners full of spiritual death. Mankind is not going to be their own savior. They cannot. Are you here? So that's all misplaced hope. But there is a hope that we're supposed to have and the hope is supposed to be grounded and established on God's word. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, Whatsoever whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. How are you going to have how are you going to have hope? Patience and comfort of the scriptures. The scriptures, the word of God is supposed to put something in you that gives you an expectation of good for your future. And we have all these stories in the Bible of people who overcame insurmountable odds. Moses brings the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh, the largest most powerful king and army in the world is trying to kill them runs them down, but guess what? God delivers them. They go through the Red Sea and Pharaoh and all of his armies are drowned. God can get you out of any mess. Are you here? We have stories in the Bible of Joseph. I mean, he sold into slavery. You talk about somebody being mistreated, sold into slavery. He's in prison. 
I mean, all of these horrible things happen to him, but because of his confidence and faith in God, he comes out of that terrible mess and he becomes ruler over the land. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? So in Egypt, nobody's higher than Joseph except the, the, the Pharaoh, the leader. What about the woman with the issue of blood? The Bible says she'd suffered many things of many physicians, was nothing bettered, gra rather grew worse for 12 years, seasick, bleeding to death, spent all of her money trying to get healed. And the natural looks like, well, what are you going to do? Doctors can't help you, don't have any money. But guess what? Her encounter with Jesus Christ changed her life and she was healed. God can heal your body no matter what's going on. God can heal your body no matter what's going on. His power is immeasurable and unlimited. You can have hope and comfort of the scriptures. You know, there's one passage I, I like to think of as probably the, well, the, the, it describes itself as an anchor for our hope. An anchor would hold a ship still. They'd drop the anchors and, and the wind would be blowing, the, wave, the wind blowing and the waves crashing on the ship, but the anchors would hold it still and keep it from blowing off course. Well, the Bible says that there's some things in his word, promise a specific promise that's supposed to be an anchor for our soul. It's supposed to keep our soul just with this expectation of good, with this amazing hope. In Hebrews chapter 6, notice what it says, beginning in verse 12, Be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we can inherit the promises through faith and through patience. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater he swore by himself, saying, so here's God's oath, God's promising something to Abraham, surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I'll multiply your seed. So God makes an oath to this man named Abraham. He says, here I'm promising you, I'm giving you my oath. I swear to you that I'm going to bless you. I swear to you that I'm going to bless you. Now, I can just tell you something. Abraham believed God, totally changed his life because God Almighty, the creator and maker of the universe, said, I swear to you something, I'm going to bless you. Now, the great news is, is in the New Testament, we find out that that promise was to Abraham and his seed in Galatians 3.16. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. You say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not a Jew, I'm not... I'm not Abraham's seed. Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Everybody say it out loud. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Okay, so, so, so what about you? Are you left out in the cold? Galatians 3.29, what does it say? See, here's the, here's the Holy Spirit revealing to you in the New Testament what was God talking about. If you belong to Christ, how many of you belong to Jesus Christ? He's the Lord of your life. If you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's what? Yes. What? You're Abraham's seed, and then notice specifically what he mentions. And heirs according to the promise. So he says you're Abraham's seed, but very specifically, you're an heir according to the promise that was made to Abraham. So go back to Hebrews 6. Notice what he says. Hebrews 6. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise, verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater in an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife if they just give an oath, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the who? Everybody say heirs. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and what? If you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed and what are you? So God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel. He confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Everybody say it's impossible for God to lie. And what did he do? He gave us his word. He gave us an oath. He gave us a promise. So those two things, God cannot lie. 
God cannot lie. If he said it, you can take it to the bank. God cannot lie. And then he swore an oath and said, I swear to you, Abraham, and we know it belongs to Abraham and his seed, I swear to you that I will bless you. Now that's supposed to do something for us in our life, but most Christians are totally ignorant that it even belongs to them. But it's supposed to be more than just a doctrine or something you say you believe. We want to have that in the experience of our life. In reality, Abraham experienced it. He experienced it in every area of his life. God wants you to experience that in your life. Can I get an amen? amen. So keep reading. Go back to about verse 17, Hebrews 6. Put it back up there. God willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, verse 18, that by two immutable things it's impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us, verse 19, which hope we have. Well, what hope is he talking about? This promise that he swore, I will bless you. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. You're supposed to have this promise of God so anchored in you that you have hope for tomorrow, not because of the government, not because of how smart you are, not because of what you can do, but because God gave an oath and said, I swear to you that I'm going to bless you. Amen. And it's supposed to hold you steady in the storms of life, in the circumstance where you're not blown around from doubt and unbelief and fear and oh my gosh, look what's happening here, look what's going on there. There might be a layoff at work. Whatever's going on, you got an anchor that holds you steady that says, wait a minute, it don't matter what's going on. I have a God. He's all powerful. He swore that he would bless me and I believe what he said and that holds me steady. Can I get an amen? amen? Everybody say it out loud. I have a God. Amen. He swore he would bless me. That holds me steady. No matter the storm. No matter what I face. I have a God. My God swore he would bless me. And I hold steady. Because I'm a believer. And I believe God. Give the Lord some praise for that one more time. Second thing to talk about is you need to see yourself with the answer. What does that mean? See yourself with the answer. Habakkuk 2, remember we looked at this. We're going to look at the second part of it. Habakkuk 2 verse 2 says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. You've got to have a plain vision. We talked about writing down your goals. You've got to write some stuff down and it's got to be you got to write down your, well, what do you expect to happen this year? Write down your goals. Well, this year I'm going to overcome this habit. I've had a pornography habit for four or five years. This year I'm going to overcome that habit. This year I'm going to overcome this habit of, of, you know, losing my temper or this habit that's bound me or this year I'm going to overcome this, this weight problem or I'm going to overcome this sickness or disease. Write down your goals. Write it down. Our business is going to do this. Our business is going to do that. Our finances, we're going to pay off this car. We're going to get out of debt. Write it down. Write the vision. Write the vision. Don't just float along like you don't know where you're going. Write the vision. But notice what it says. Write the vision. Second part of verse 2. Go back up to verse 2. Write the vision. Notice this part, make it plain. Everybody say, make it plain. Make it plain. Now, now I, I'm going to stop a minute because right here, this is where a vast majority of people that believe the Word of God, that write down goals, kind of know where they're supposed to go, they don't do this. They don't make it plain. The word plain actually means explain. Write the vision Make it plain. 
Okay, so we're in here. We just got through saying, we understand. I hope that you saw that you're blessed with the blessing of Abraham. Okay, well, what does that mean? Okay, you're blessed with the blessing. Well, what does that blessing mean? Explain. What does it mean? Well, I mean, it means I can have a nice house. Well, wait a minute. I mean, that could mean 15,000 different things. A nice house to some person might be a three-bedroom, two-bath, you know, uh, home that's not even a brick home. That might be really nice, depending on where you're at in the world, who you're at. I mean, I lived a lot of my life. I would have sure loved to have had a three-bedroom, two-bath house. A little frame house, I'd have been sure happy. That would have been, whoo. But for some people, maybe it's a three-bedroom, two-bath brick home. For some people, maybe it's Mar-a-Lago. For some people, maybe it's a six-bedroom, six-bathroom house on t t uh, 20 acres with a nice lake on it and whatever. Okay, so you're blessed. Explain. What does that look like in your life? What does it look like? Okay, well, my health is blessed. Okay, what does that look like? I'm blessed with great health. What does that look like? What do you mean great health? Great health to you and great health to me might be two different things. Great health to one person means they can get out and run a marathon. That's not what I mean. <laughs> Are you here? Explain. Write the vision. Make it plain. Make it plain. Faith cannot create the hope if it is so vague. Well, I'm blessed. It's so vague. It means a thousand different things. Explain. Well, I say our family's blessed. Okay. Explain. What does that mean? You have a blessed family. See, we don't think these things through. You know, I, I thought this was interesting. I, <clears throat> I read a story about a uh, professional golfer, and he got invited from the king, one of the kings in Saudi Arabia, to come over and teach him golf and to play golf with him for a week. And so he <clears throat> cleared his schedule, went over there and played golf with this king for a week, and he was showing him golf, and they were golfing together, and he took care of him over there and did all of that. Well, when it was time to go, the king came to him and said, hey, uh, you know, you came over here. I'm, I'm really thankful you did that, and I learned a lot, so I want to do something for you. And the guy was trying to be humble, and he just said, no, I, <clears throat> man, you took good care of me over here. I really enjoyed my time. I, I don't really need anything. But he said the king was very insistent. And so he didn't want to offend him. He said, well, I, I collect golf clubs. And he said, so uh, uh, a golf club would be great if you could just get me a golf club. So he... He said, okay, and he left. He went home on the plane, and he, he said he was thinking about what kind of golf club this king, because he had pretty much, you know, unlimited resources, what kind of golf club he might get him. He thought, maybe it'll be a, maybe it'll be a solid gold golf club. He didn't know, so he's expecting to get a golf club in the mail. Well, a week went by, nothing. Two weeks went by, a few weeks went by. He didn't get any, any, any golf club, nothing in the mail. And all of a sudden, he got a registered letter, and it was from this king, his organization, whatever, and he opens it up and he takes it out and there's a deed to 500 acres of a golf club, <laughs> country club. A golf club means one thing to some people and one thing to somebody else. Explain. Okay, my business is going to have the best year. Okay, what does that mean? Does that mean what? You're going to pay all your salaries, and at the end of the year, you're going to have $25 left over? $25,000? $100,000? Our best year ever. $100,000? $500,000? Explain. What are you expecting to happen? What, your faith can't just do something vague. Boy, I tell you what, I'm blessed. I tell you, one of these days I'm going to be able to write big checks. 
How big? Explain. I mean, I'm going to make some deposits. You know, I'm believing God's going to bless me financially. Explain. Write out a deposit slip. Put an amount on there. Put a date on it. So you can look at it and see it. S service is rendered. Explain. What, what do you mean blessed? What, what is that to you? A deposit slip for, oh, wow, 25000 50000 100,000. Explain. It can't be so vague that your faith can't bring it into reality. We're going to do this. Explain. Write the vision. Yes, you got to have goals, but remember, you got to make it plain. Everybody say, make it plain. Make it plain. That's where we missed it. That's where a lot of Christians have missed it. It's not plain enough for them to get the reality of it in their life and to see that. Okay, so you want to have your own business? Explain, what does that mean? Doing, doing this, doing what? What does it look like? You want to have a house? Okay, nice house. Explain. Make the vision very plain. Cut out pictures of the house that you want. You know, we've built a lot of stuff here, a lot of buildings going on. I don't like just to see you know, the architectural plan, I want them to fix me a picture. Amen. I want to see it. I want it plain. So my faith can say, here it is, boy, right here. It's got these columns. It's got this. It's got that. It's got this driveway. It's got the, I want to see. Write the vision. Make it plain. What is your vision for the future? Explain. Are you here? You know, I thought this was interesting. Another story. I know I've got to hurry, and I'm trying to hurry. But So a minister said he had a lady come to him, and she thought she was getting older. So she's 30 years old, so she's not really an old maid, but she thought she was an old maid. So if you're out there and you're 30, don't send me any mean tweets. I'm not saying you're an old maid. Okay. <laughs> I love you. Jesus loves you. Okay. <laughs> so, but she came to the pastor and said, I, I, I want a husband. I want you to pray for me that I'll get a husband. He said, well, I mean, that's not really specific enough. What kind of husband do you want? Well, I want him to be a Christian. Well, okay. That, that still covers a lot of ground. So he handed her a pencil, a piece of paper, and he said, write down 10 descriptions of this man. What is, what is he supposed to be? Make it plain. She says, well, I, I want him to be, be kind of tall. So she, he, she wrote down tall. I want him to be, uh, he said, well, you want him middle size? You want him fat? You want him skinny? She said, I want him skinny. He said, all right, write down skinny. Well, what color do you want his hair to be? I want him to have black hair. Write it down. And so she went through this list. One of the lists was, I want him to, to be musical. Wrote it down, 10 things. He said, all right, close your eyes. He said, do you see this? You, you see a tall, skinny Christian who's musical and whatever else that was on the list. Do you see that in your mind's eye? Write the vision, make it. Try it again. Write the vision, make it. She said, yeah, I see a picture in my mind of this, of this particular guy. He said, okay, now we're going to pray. Father, we'll pray. We're asking you. You see what she says? She wants a husband. Here's what she wants about this guy, and we believe we receive it. So he said a few weeks went by, a month went by, two months went by. He said somebody started attending their church. He was tall, skinny, dark hair. He was a music teacher at the school. And for some reason, he was, even though he was three or four years younger than this, this other lady, he, he started hanging around her and liking her. In a short period of time, they got married. Write the vision, make it what? Mm, Got to make it plain. Okay, so you want to, I just want to lose some weight this year. Okay. You lost a quarter of a pound. The year's over. All right. Way to go, baby. <laughs> Write the vision. Make it. 
Got to make it plain. Now, there's a story in the Bible, and I, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it real quick for you. So uh, the story about uh, Jacob and Laban. Laban had been cheating Jacob out of his wages, changed them 10 times. Finally, Laban says, I'm going to leave. This is in Genesis chapter 30. He says, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to work somewhere. I'm doing something else. You've been cheating me. And Laban said, no, I, I can see the Lord's with you, and he's blessed me because of you, and I want you to stay. You just tell me what you want your wages to be. And that's what we'll do. And so Jacob said, well, I want, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll take all the speckled and the spotted lambs and sheep out of, out of the herd. Any of them that are born that are speckled and spotted, I'm going to take those. And ring staked, I think the King James says. Speckled, spotted, and ring staked. He said, I'll take those. And so Laban's thinking, hey, that's a pretty good deal. So what he did is he told his sons, he said, go to the herd, get out all the speckled and spotted ones and all the ring stake. Just leave all the solid color ones there. And he took all of those out of the herd and took them three days journey away so they couldn't possibly get back over there. And he said, all right, Jacob, here's your herd and there are no speckled, no spotted in there. So you know what he did? He went out to the watering trough. Genesis 30, notice what it says here. I want to start about verse 37. Jacob got green branches of poplar, almond, and plane trees and stripped off some of the bark so that the branches had white stripes on them. He placed these branches in front of the flocks at their drinking troughs. He put them there because the animals mated when they came to drink. So when the goats bred in front of the branches, they produced young that were what? What? So he, 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 here's the watering trough on this side. He puts up all these, looks like a picket fence, and it's, it's got all these colors of white and speckled. And so he's looking through there, and his vision of all the sheep is speckled, spotted, and streaked. And guess what? That's what they started having. Why? Faith has to have something to go for. We're spirit beings. In fact, the word meditate, one of the meanings of the word meditate is imagine. That means to rehearse something over and over in your mind. See it that way. Think about it. Meditate, mutter, ponder, imagine. Imagine means this, to form ideas or representations in the mind. Can you imagine yourself going to the doctor and the doctor saying, uh, so you need to get this in your mind. Clear. You go to the doctor and he says, hey, man, I just checked your blood. You don't need, you don't need any insulin anymore. I just checked your blood pressure. It's perfect. It's normal. And you see yourself in your mind's eye. That's where you went. That's what they said. Write the vision. Make it plain. You have to, you have to see it and you have to get it very clear in your mind. Can I get an amen to you? All right, so the, the third thing, last thing is this. You need to speak words of victory in faith, not fear or doubt. Proverbs 18, verse 7, notice what it says. A fool's mouth is his what? His lips are the snare of his soul. What does verse 21 say? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, or one translation says, those that make a friend out of it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your tongue, your words coming out of your mouth are either taking you towards your goal and towards your dream. You're either life is being pumped into that or death. So you're saying I'm blessed and here's what I'm believing for and then in a time of frustration and you're gonna have it, you ever been upset about something? Very frustrated about it? You know what you wanna do when you are? You wanna talk. You want to talk. The devil will put pressure on you to start speaking negative about this. I knew it wasn't going to work. I can't believe this has happened. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You, you, you better speak in agreement with what you're looking at, what your vision is, what your goal is, and it'll, it'll take your life that way. Jesus said in John 6, he said this, the words that I speak unto you, their spirit, their life. So you need to find God's words. You need to be speaking those words of life over you, over your family and your circumstance. Can I get an amen? I mean, if you become what you believe, you must speak what you believe, not just what you presently have. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the thermostat on the wall. It sets what the temperature is supposed to be. It's not that way when you first set it there. If you come in here and it's 90 and, and you don't want it 90, you put it on 68. And somebody said, well, you're, that thermostat's a liar. It said it's 68. Well, just wait a minute. That's the goal. That's your hope. When you first start saying it, it doesn't look like it yet. But leave it alone. The, the faith is the machines working outside to produce the power. Faith has the power to change your life. But you've got to leave it set. You've got to have the goal out there, and you've got to keep speaking and keep saying until that image is so clear on the inside of you. It's clear. This is what I see. See yourself. Here, all right, here. Sometimes we don't take time just to stop. Take 15 minutes. Start writing down what we're believing and get real specific and begin to see it. Amen. Okay. You want your business to be blessed? Explain. Write it down. You want your finances to have the best financial year? Okay. What does that mean? Explain. Write the vision. Explain. And then speak in agreement with that. Don't speak contrary to God's word. Can I get an amen from you?